But speaking of connected, let's get connected to the Holy Spirit today through his word. Can we do that? I know it's hot, but come on. <laughs> Let, let's, let's get into the word of God, all right? I know you don't want to hear from me. You didn't come to hear from Pastor Dan or Pastor Jim or the older or the young. You came to hear from God. And let's just, let's invite the Holy Spirit in to be our teacher today, to speak to us and to teach us that through his word, I believe a great and a very important thing for us to understand and to, to have some clarity on today. So let's go to the word of God. So Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this house. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to meet and to gather. Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us today. Lord, minister to our hearts, open it. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes and our ears so that we'd hear, see, and understand, God, your word, your principles, your precepts, your will for our lives as we walk out of here tonight. Lord, that we would be your church, would reflect, would reflect your glory for the world to see. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done in this house. Lord, we give you the praise. Lord, we give you the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we ask that you bless all the churches across the Inland Empire tonight and around the week through the course of the week that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we're all co-laborers in the body of Christ. We are the church together, glorifying one name, that is the name of Jesus. And Lord, we give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. We all together said, amen. amen. Well, tonight I thought, I, I, I thought I'd maybe talk a little bit of a different thing, and I think it's more of a clarity message. I think it's a little bit more of a kind of like, what do we do? What do we have a tendency, tendency to do? What do we have a, 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 sometimes we forget a little bit of what we know, or we kind of get one way or the other. And so I thought I'd start by just telling a little story. A couple of, we, a couple of weeks, months ago now, um, I had some time with my nephew. He's in, he's in high school, and he needed some help in algebra. And you know, it's so funny. I, I was just laughing the whole time he needed help in algebra because I thought to myself, the, in, the very first thing when I sat down with him at the table and started working with him on algebra was I went back to when I was in school and I asked that question to my algebra teacher, when am I ever going to need to use this again? <laughs> You're laughing, some of you, because you asked that same question. And then you had kids. And then you realize, this is when you're going to need to use this again, when you're teaching them how to do it at home, because they didn't listen in class. So anyways, I was helping my nephew uh, with some algebra problems, and it was, it was kind of fun, you know, like trying to just bring back what, you know, was stored so deep on the inside of me. It's like the Word of God sometimes. It's like math. Okay, not really, but... Um, so we were talking, we were going through, we were working through some problems, and what he had to do is he had to figure out the answer for X. It was one of those equations, you know what I'm talking about, like X minus 3 equals Y, and it's like, oh no, what are we doing? So as we're going through it, I'm trying to tell him, like, okay, what do you know? Tell me what they've taught you, because I'm like, can you just try to explain it to me, and then maybe I'm smarter than you, and I can figure it out by the way you explain it to me, because I have no clue anymore. Thank the Lord for YouTube. So... As we're helping through, as we're working through these algebra problems, I remember there was something that we learned in algebra with all the different acronyms like PEMDAS, which I had to Google what that meant again because I totally forgot. There was something that I remembered about algebra, and that was the balance of equations. And that whatever you do to one side of the equal sign, you have to do to the other side of the equal sign. So if you want to subtract 3 from one side, you've got to subtract 3 from both sides in order for the equation to be balanced. And, and what happens is as we were kind of working through the problems, you know, we kind of get through, and he, and he had, because he has technology, man, it's amazing. He has an app where he can, like, take a picture of the problem on his phone, and then it gave him the answer. And I'm like, what do you need me for? <laughs> but it didn't tell you how to get there. So we had the answers, and so we would go through these, and we'd kind of be like, I'd come back and be like, okay, what'd you get? And, well, the answer's supposed to be, and you're, like, not even close. It's not even, like, in a ballpark. Like, what happened? And we go through, oh, dude, you were supposed to subtract here, and you were supposed to add to this, or you had to balance the equations. It, we, you just kinda, it was just something that wasn't, you know, familiar to him yet. And it was just amazing how that kind of came back up. But taking that illustration, taking that, kind of applying it to life, because that's algebra, and, you know, we don't relate to algebra very much. But what happens is there's a balance in life. And so often we try to, we try to live a balanced life. We try to live, you know, uh, the different things in life, you know, like a balance. Here's a great balance. What you sow is what you reap, right? Like, so you have to sow to reap. But what happens is we get through life we kind of go through life, we get lazy, or we get complacent, or we get comfortable, or, or, or we, 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 we try to take the short route, or whatever it might be, and we, we try to get the balance 
you know, we, we want to try to focus more on, on the one side of the equal sign than on the other side of the equal sign. We want to get to the answer side and not really deal a lot with the problem side. But there's a balance that has to be uh, brought into that. And what happens is you think about even culturally, there's a balance with things. I th think about like balance, balance politically, political correctness. I believe political correctness at its heart, there's a balance to it. But then you get people that, that take political correctness and then they start to take the truth factor behind political correctness and start to remove that from the equation without doing something on one side. And then all, you get, then all of a sudden you get a culture that no matter what you say, no matter how correct you are, no matter how politically or how PC you are, it's, it's all out of whack. It's out of balance. It's like, it's like a teeter-totter, right? This happens to us in our lives. This happens to us sometimes financially, right? We, we, with our finances, I, I want to I wanna spend more than I get in. There's a balance, you know. You, you're actually supposed to balance your, your checkbook. For people who are like 34 and under, you're like, checkbook, did, did I get one of those? Yeah, like at one point when you started a checking account, I have a checking account? I don't even have that. Pastor Luke, I put it all in a, in a, in a can under my mattress. Either way, there's a balance there with our finances. There's a balance there with our emotions. You see, you've got withdrawals and deposits emotionally. When you, go with, when you interact with people, there are people that are going to withdraw from you, right? They're going to take out of you, and you're like, oh, Pastor Luke, you don't even know. You don't even understand how much they withdraw. Like, they have overdraft fees every time we come together emotionally because all they do is just kind of suck it out. Well, there's a balance, right? You have to deposit. So you have to go to somebody that will deposit into you so that somebody can withdraw from you. There's a balance in life. And as, as we live, as we operate, as, as things happen, we, we, we pay attention to one more than the other or, or we lose sight of one or we lose the idea of one or we just don't focus as much on one and as on the other. And do you remember back in the day before technology there was a scale and the way you figured or you determined weight was a balance, right? You had to put something on there and then you had to put little blocks or paper clips or grams or whatever it might be to get that scale to balance out, you're, you're probably going, Pastor Luke, I don't even remember that. That's like way beyond my days. I thought so. And you know, I feel like there was nobody that really helped to visualize and help us to learn without ever learning better than Jim Henson. And so I thought I would have Ernie remind us of the balance of life. Check it out. But this pile of cookies over here is heavier because it has pulled the scale down low like this. If this side here were heavier, it would go down like that, you see? But this side here is lower. Now what I wanted to do is I wanted to share these cookies with Bert, but I'm not sure exactly how to do it so that they're even. You, excuse me, Ernie. Oh, hi there, I, Cookie. You, I, I was listening. You know how to do that? You don't know how? No, not really. No? I, I was trying okay. to think I about know it. how. I help. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I help. Oh, okay. well, thank you. Okay, good. I guess. Let me see now. This side here is low. That means there are more cookies on than that side. So this is heavier, right? That's heavier over there, yes. Okay. Okay, now what you do is you take more cookies off this side, okay? Like this. Oh, sure, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Now that side there is lighter, right? And this side here is heavier um, because now there are more cookies down here. Now this side over here is the heavy side of the scale. Oh, right, me fix that. Oh, yeah? Um, oh, no, no, that, that, um, that didn't work, Cookie. Look here. See, now this side of the scale over here is the heavy uh, side. You see, oh, it still doesn't course, balance, Cookie. But I really fixed this time, watch. Um, hey, look at that. Look at that. It balances. Um, it balances. But wait a minute. What? There are no cookies left. Uh, well, I, 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 you ate all the cookies. I know. I have this perfectly, this really good scale here. And nothing to weigh on it. Oh, oh. Wait, wait, really good scale? Yes, it's a really good scale. Let's see. Mm -hmm. oh. mm. um. Scale not so good. I taste it better. Bye-bye. And so like Ernie, with his conundrum, there's a balance in life. It's like this great scale of things that we need to pay attention to on both sides. 
And if you want to take it to one, to, one, to one step further, it's kind of like a mathematical equation that applies to us spiritually. And you know, the Bible is actually full of a lot of spiritual equations that we need to understand that there's a balance in these equations that we need to focus continually on. And today I want to take a look at this equation. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Matthew. If you've got, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Matthew in the 11th chapter. If you have a ribbon, also put a ribbon in Matthew the 28th chapter. So Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 28. And, and, and I'm not going to lead you on. I'm not going to leave you hanging. Pastor Luke, I'm on the edge of my seat after watching the, the Sesame Street. I just, I have to know what is this equation of balance in my life. And it's so easy. I even titled the message after the equation. Are you ready? Do you want to know what the equation is? I know it's hot. Do you want to know what the equation is? Yes. The equation is so simple. The equation is come and go. Okay, now you're like, Pastor Luke, I'm even more confused than I was before. And I'll explain it to you. The equation is come and go. Like a teeter-totter, there's two sides, two sides, two balances of our lives that we need to understand and that we need to pay diligent attention to and to have a clear and precise understanding of what the Word of God says about these topics. So Matthew, the 11th chapter, let's look at this. Let's, let's look at the first side of the equation, Mark. In Matthew, the 11th chapter... <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is, is, is talking here. And he says in verse number 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse number 30, Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, the first half of that equation is Jesus says, come. Jesus says, come. And the very first part of that equation is, is that we've got to understand, we've got to go to Jesus. You see, there's no, by, there's no, by, no other way that we, we find salvation. There's no other way we find deliverance. There's no other way that we find the peace of God that surpasses understanding. You see, there's no other way in our lives to get through our lives the way God desires to get through our lives except through Jesus. And as we look at the equation, as we look at the scale, we say, Pastor Luke, of course, I've got to go to Jesus. But the reality is, is even though we know we have to go to Jesus, not always do we pay the attention we need to be paying attention to the balance of the scale in our lives by going to Jesus. Have you ever had somebody, and I, and, and I know it's not you, but have you ever had somebody that it's like no matter when they talk to you, every time they call you, every time there's an interaction with you, you know exactly why. When their phone number pops up on your screen, you think, all right, what do you think? They want something. The only reason they come to me is that they want something. And I know none, that's not you. None, no, you've never done that. That's, not, that, that's the people who, who didn't come tonight, right? That, everybody else, that's them, right? You are not those ones. But so often what happens is, is we get that mentality. I know in my own life, I had that. Pastor Dan was talking about those sins, you know, those mistakes that you say, you know, man, I'm not going to do this ever again. And, and, and you say, God, I, I, I'm changing my ways. Thank you, Lord. Never going to do it again. And then like 20 minutes later, you did it again. And then you're like, okay, okay, all right, all right, Lord. I know what I did. I, I, I went back and I analyzed why I did that. And I recognize why that happened. And I'm not going to do what I did to get me to do what I didn't want to do again. Lord, forever I'm, I'm changed. I'm, I, hallelujah. Never doing it again, right? And then what happens the next day? You do it again. Lord, this time for real. For real. This is it. This is it. You, you, we've all been there. This is it, right? What happens the next day? You know, you can go a week without. You can go, go a month, go six months, go a year, whatever it might be. And sometimes we come to God and we have this mentality of like, God, I feel so, like, I feel so weary. I feel so tired. I feel so exhausted of coming to you. I feel like the only reason I ever pray is because I'm coming to you because I've got a problem. The only reason I ever approach you is because there's something going on in my life that I need help with. And, 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 and I feel bad. I feel conviction. I feel, I feel down in my spirit. And because I feel that in my spirit, I feel like maybe I just ought to take a break and just give you some time. 
I don't want you to feel like I, I always come to you with my problems. But you see, Jesus says it right here. In Matthew, the 11th chapter, he says, come to me. He doesn't say, come to me, all you people that got your life all together and prim and proper and everything is exactly how it should be. He says, come to me, all who are heavy laden. Come to me, all of you who got problems. Come to me, all of you who have drama. Come to me, all of you who have things going on in your life. Because you see, the answer is not found in, in Dr. Phil. The answer is not found with Oprah. The answer is not found with positive messages. The answer is not found in, in psychology. The answer is not found with sociology. The answer is not found within politics. Jesus says, you have got to come to me and I will put my yoke I will put my mantle I will put my burden upon you and you will find that it is easy and that it is light and he says and I will teach you I love that he says you will learn from me he doesn't just say come and I'm going to load you up he says come and I will show you come and I will deliver you come and I will speak to you come and I will minister to you Jesus wants us church to come to him so what happens is we we kind of feel bad we don't come to him you know what else happens is we come to Jesus because all we want is our problem fixed but the Bible says that the word of God knows man from the inside out the word of God is a discerner of the hearts you see God doesn't see us just for uh, human beings in which he doesn't understand God knows our thoughts God knows our intention God knows our future he is all at once everywhere in the beginning in the end in the future in the past right here somewhere else God knows you and God knows your heart God knows your attention and so what happens one of the one of the reasons and why we don't pay attention to this equation or this side of the equation is that we come to Jesus with the wrong intentions and we've seen it before the equation of come and go you could say the equation of come and go looks like this I come to Jesus my problem gets fixed and I go back to my life that is not the equation in which I'm talking about today you see, Jesus says, come to me, all who are heavy laden. Come and I'll, and I'll put my yoke, I'll put my yoke around you and you will learn from me. I will surround you, I will fill you, I will be within you. Everything will change about you. God has a desire for you. That your life is supposed to be totally different with Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes as Christians, we don't get that memo. That we have Jesus and then what? But you see, there is no and then what after Jesus. You see, God's plan, God's purpose, and God's power through Jesus Christ on the inside of us is supposed to create such a radical transformation on the inside of us outward that people look at us and literally say, you're like a whole new you. And you're like, oh, that's my diet. I lost some weight. I feel, I feel like a new person. I dyed my hair. I, I, I'm just trying to turn over a new leaf. No, you are a new person. Why? Because literally through Jesus Christ, the Bible says you are a new creation. But God wants us to come to him through Jesus Christ with right intentions, with a whole heart, a familiar section of scripture. Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, we know Jeremiah 29, chapter uh, 11, for I know the thoughts and plans I have, says for you, says the Lord, you know, thoughts to prosper you and not to, to harm you, thoughts to succeed. Jeremiah 29 Chapter 13, or verse 13, says it like this. It says, God says, I, I, I want you to find me. You see, I, I, I'm not trying to hide from you. I'm not trying to mask myself. I'm not trying to play peekaboo with you. I want you to visibly and, 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 and physically and spiritually and emotionally and mentally and financially. God says, I want you to know me. I want you to come to me. I want you to come to me with your problems. I want you to come to me with your kids. I want you to come to me with your job. I want you to come to me with your emotions. I want you to come to me with your family. I want you to come to me with your whatever it is that's important to you. God says, I want you to come to me, but I want you to come to me with all of your heart. Because he says, you'll seek me and find me. Equation when you look with all of your heart. 
See, God has a desire for us. He says, I want to do something in your life. Sometimes we're sitting around, and I know I've been there in my own life. Sometimes we're sitting around saying, God, do something in my life. And God says, come. Come. We talked about this cross in the Red Sea a couple of weeks ago, that seeing our deliverance and walking in our deliverance are two completely different things. And you see, God says, I don't want you just to see me. I want you to come to me. I want you to take the step of faith, and I want you to get in. And so what happens is we come. We come and we, we, we get into the, to the word of God. We, we, it begins to change us. It begins to mold us. And, 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 and all of a sudden things happen. And, you know, God says, I want you to do greater things, not lesser things. Did you know Jesus said, Jesus said when I leave, you will do greater things than the things that I've done? Yeah. And we, we question. We say, God, where is that? I, I haven't seen that. You know, God, I just go to work. God, I just work at, at the steel mill. God, I just, I just work at the office. God, I just, I just deal with kids all day long. God, I, I just, I just, I, I, I'm at school. And, and, and I, I, your word says that I, I'm supposed to be doing things that are greater than the things that you did. And, and, and I'm just waiting on that. God, when is it? God says, I want you to come. Come to me, he says. I will teach you. I will lay upon you. I will show you. I will fill you. I will surround you. He says. You know, when I was a kid, I was real into models. Those detailed scale models. I mean, I remember I had jets and boats and sailboats. And, and I remember my grandpa one time, him and I built a model together and we painted this F-16. And it was like the most amazing thing. I mean, I had it on display. even took like fishing wire and hung them up on the ceiling, all the airplanes and all the, the boats. I put them up on, on shelves and they sat there and they looked exactly like the real thing. But did you know those airplanes never flew? Did you know that there was no jet engine on the inside of that little plastic, you know, 12-inch model? In the battleship, there was no cannons. There was no, there, was no, there was no guns. There was no little men, little ants running around. In my imagination as a kid, I might have thought that. But in reality, those models never accomplished what the original did because they were smaller. And Jesus didn't die and come on a cross and die for you and I so that we could just look like him and be little models of Jesus. He says, I want you to come. I want you to come to me because I came so that you would look like me. And he says, I came so that you would live like me. He said, greater things you will do than what I do. You see, church, your destiny, your plan, your purpose is to not be a model up on a shelf that looks kind of like Jesus. Your plan, your purpose, your destiny is to be conformed into a completely transformed, created into a completely new image, a completely new creation that thinks, that acts, that operates, and that lives in exactly what Jesus lived, the power and the will of God, and sees things change in your world all around you. That's God's purpose. That's God's destiny. So we say, God, I want to come to you, Pastor Luke. That's why I'm here today. And exactly that is one of the biggest reasons we miss out on this. Is we say, God, I'll come. And I'll come. And I'll come to church. And I'll come. And I'll worship. And I'll come. And I'll read that book at home. And I'll come. And, and I'll lift my hands. And I'll come. And, 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 I, and, I'll, and I'll get that experience. I, they, they worship. And it was so bomb that I got, I got goosebumps on my, on my arms. God, I, I, I got it. But you see, that's only one side of the equation. And God didn't create us to just come, come, come. And keep coming. And keep just, just you know, just fill yourself up with, with church. And just fill yourself up with the word of God. Why? Because Jesus... To the people, he said, come to me. At the end of his ministry, you know what Jesus said? The second half of the equation? After the equal sign? Look at it in Matthew, the 28th chapter. Matthew, the 28th chapter, the second half of that equation that we have to focus on. Matthew, the 28th chapter, Jesus says it like this. Verse number 18, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I love that. I love that. That's just amazing. Jesus says, I got it all. There's nothing. There's nothing. You know what all authority means? That means all authority. That doesn't mean like some. That doesn't mean like, okay, well, you know, that was too big for Jesus. Your sickness, that disease, that calling, whatever it might be. That, that, that's, that's a little bit too big. Jesus says all authority has been given to me. To, to me, he says, to him. But then look what it says. 
Verse number 19. Go, therefore. Therefore what? Therefore the fact that Jesus has all of the authority and now he sends us out as disciples. Jesus says, go. So the first part of the equation on one side of the, on one side of the equal sign of our lives, the one side where Ernie had uh, not enough cookies was Jesus says, come to me. Actually, you could say it like this. The side that I think in, in reality, the side that Ernie had too many cookies Jesus said, come to me. We, we come a lot to church. We get a lot of the word of God. We are, as an American, we, we, Americans, we believe and we know and we have an understanding of who Jesus is because we have at some point in our lives come to him already. But see, that's only one side of the equation because on the other side of the equation and the balance in mathematics, since we're bringing mathematics into the Bible, because I believe that science and the word of God, do, do, do they correlate with each other. They don't contradict each other, but that's another story for another day. So if we're going to take the rules of mathematics, what you do to one side, you have to do to the other side, which is the balance of equations, which means if I focus on coming to Jesus, I have to give equal focus in my life on going with Jesus. Going with Jesus. So one side you've got come to Jesus equals go with Jesus. Because you see, Jesus said all authority has been given to me. He didn't say all authority has been given to you. He said all authority has been given to me, which means we've got to take him with us in order for anything in our lives to happen. You see, Jesus doesn't want us just to come. Come to church, get a bunch of word. Amen, I felt good about that. Jesus, listen, God, God didn't die incarnate. Jesus Christ didn't die on a cross so that we could just experience him when we come. You see, I love experiential worship. I think it's a great thing when you get into a worship service and it's light and, or it's dark and there's an atmosphere and there's the, 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 the hazer machine. You're like, is that the Shekinah or is that a hazer? I can't tell. And the lights are moving and, and the worship bands in sync and it's just and then they and then they sing oceans, right? And then it's just like, oh my Lord. <laughs> and you get that experience. But you see, God says, I don't want you just to come and have an experience. Because an experience is something that you get and you say, Man, that was a great experience. I have a great experience at the movie theaters. Right? When the THX thing comes up on the movie thing, it's a great experience. And the sounds all around you like, that was a, a surround sound experience. God says, I came so that you would have an encounter. An encounter is you come, you step out, and you encounter something. You, you take a journey, and all of a sudden along that journey, you have an encounter. And an encounter leads to a relationship, and a relationship leads to transformation, and transformation leads to capacity, and capacity leads to going with Jesus. You see, Jesus said, come to me, you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke and upon you, and I will teach you. He will teach you. He will teach you. Why? So that you could sit at church. So that you could feel good about yourself. So that you could, you could say, man, I got it all and I had goosebumps. He said, I will teach you. Why? So that later on in life you will go with me Amen. to the world. Amen. To the world. To the world. It's a challenge. I get it. You don't have to clap. You're like, Pastor, look, I don't, I, it's hot in here already. I'm sweating. And now you're challenging me. And it's raining outside. And I'm a Californian. And I don't know how to drive in the rain. So I'm already thinking about my safety on the way home. And you try to bring a, a complicated message tonight. But the truth of the matter is, is that we focus so much on coming that we miss out on going. And you see, we get to this, I'm going to come. And I'm going to come, and, I, and I'm coming, and so now I come, and I'm, I'm a part of a church. And then, amen, praise God, I'm a part, and I'm, I'm coming to church. And they tell me i got to come twice a week to spiritually grow. So I'm coming twice a week, and I'm seeing the growth, amen. But now all of a sudden, something stirs in my heart. And I look over there, and I say, there's an injustice being done around the world. Or, or down the street in my neighborhood, there's somebody, and, and I begin to look at them, and I think, oh, man, they need prayer. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to call the church because I come to church. I'm going to call the church and I'm going to and I'm going to have them pray for them. And we miss the equation. You see, Jesus says, come to me, you who are heavy laden, come to me. But then Jesus at the very end, at the very end, the challenge, the commission that he gives to his disciples is not just go to church and expect the pastor to be the one that does all the ministry. 
to be the, to, well, it's the guy that's on stage that evangelizes everybody else. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know how to share Jesus, so I, I just let them do that. You see, our lives are the vessels in which we share Jesus Christ. Our lives are the vessels in which we experience and we encounter God on a daily basis. And we bring the experience and the encounter of God to people outside of the walls of this building. Because you know what really, in reality, what this is? We call it a sanctuary. We call this a church. You know what this is? This is a building. And a strong windstorm, an earthquake, whatever it might be, can, can, can wipe this building out in a moment. But that doesn't mean that the church changes anything. Because like Teresa talked about, the church is not a building that you go to. The church is you and me. And we might carry different names like Methodist and Lutheran, Episcopalian. We might have different denominations and we might be a part of a different body part in the body of Christ. But we are all joined together in the body of Christ. And Jesus says, I want my body to get out into the world and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he said, greater things you will do than, than the things that I have done. Why? Because I go to my Father and I have taught you. I have trained you. I have instilled my words which are life and truth and then on top of that I have given you my Holy Spirit to get out into the world and to pray and to sow and to build and to grow and to share and to reflect and to shine the light of Jesus Christ wherever we go as living, walking, breathing uh, 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 mirrors of God, not just models on a shelf that reflect some kind of a glory. Jesus says in the last days there will people that have a form of godliness but deny his power. That is not the church today. Why? We are full of the power of Jesus Christ and he says I don't want you to get together and have a little Pentecostal meeting where everybody's like, yeah, and then go home and do nothing about it. I want you to have that and take it with you. Take it with you to your family. Take it with you to your job. Take it with you in your finances. Take it with you wherever you go. To go with Jesus. To go with Jesus. But what happens? Because we talked about coming and coming, coming to Jesus. Man, I'm sweating like a pig. You think you're hot? Man, come on. It's getting Pentecostal up in here with all this sweat. I got an illustration, but I'm going to drink something real quick. <laughs> got to be resourceful in this, right? You see, one of the things that happens, we talked about some of the things and some of the reasons that we miss out on coming to Jesus. We come to Jesus with the wrong heart or we only want to come to Jesus and we miss the other side of the equation. It's the same thing with going with Jesus. There's things that we do and we say, well, I'm going, Pastor Luke, and I'm not seeing anything. I'm going, I'm stepping out, and nothing's happening. But you see, there's very important in that equation that we pay attention to it, and it says to go with Jesus. With Jesus. And so what happens is we say, well, I'm going. I'm going because Jesus would do this. But is that what he sent you to do? And so we go and we step out with an agenda. We go and we step out with a cause. We go and we step out with, with something that, you know, that, that, that sounds good or that, that's, the biggest, that's the biggest fad or it's the biggest movement right now and it's the trend and, and I want to get on board of the trend and I want to get on board of what's cool and what everybody else is doing and, and I want to be like that. And so we go, but we don't do it with Jesus. We just go. And then we get burned. And then we say, well, I stepped out and God wasn't there. But he said, I don't want you to step out without me. Jesus says, all authority was given to me, not to you. So he says, I want you to come and I want you to go with me because I got the power, you got the body. And I want to take the power and I want to put it into the body and I want it to get out into the world and to see the world change. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, I think it's in the 19th chapter. I'll put it up on, on the overhead for you guys. Acts in the 19th chapter. There's a couple of itinerant Jewish exorcists. I mean, that's kind of a, that's a job. Like, you want to have a business card, right? <laughs> what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a demon caster outer. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to question you. Oh, man, I don't, all right, man, whatever. Your job is your job. So a couple of, says a couple of Jewish itinerant uh, exorcists took it upon, look what it says, it took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. I, I love this. It took it upon themselves, okay? There you go. Assumption, right? Presumption. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Presumption will masquerade itself as faith but result in death. 
right? In this case, presumption will masquerade itself as faith and result in a, in a, in a royal butt kicking by some demons and the removal of your clothes in public so that you walk away, run away naked. Okay, anyways, that, that was spoiler alert. They took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord who had or call the name of Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exercise you. I love this. We, we exercise you. Not like we run you on a treadmill, right? We get you out. We cast you out. We, we exercise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the story goes on. I don't know if I have it on there, verse number 14. And so there were seven sons of Sceva and a Jewish chief, who, uh, Jewish chief priest who did this, verse number 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? The Bible says, I don't think I have it on there, but the Bible says it goes on a story that they, that they came on. Those guys, they beat them up and they sent, they ran away naked. You see, going without Jesus will result in disaster in your life. And so here they are. They go, but, but Pastor Luke, Jesus said, Jesus said it. Pastor Luke, Jesus said it in my name. Use my name. I've got the authority. Jesus said, use my name. Jesus even said it like this, though. He came back with that same statement. He says, you're going to come to me one day and be like, Jesus, we cast out demons in your name. We cast them out. You see, they went from that guy, and they came on me. I cast them out of that guy. We cast out demons in your name. And Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't know you. Because you can go with the name of Jesus and expect the effectiveness of it. But the authority was given to Jesus, but it is exercised. It is used and it is put into place by you and I when we go with Jesus. With Jesus. Not just because of Jesus or in the name of you, we ha you and I have got to take him with us wherever we go in life. To go with Jesus. Not to just go on our own, but to go with Jesus. You know, it's like this. I remember when I was, a, when I was a, a younger and I was trying to try to make it in the snowboarding world. It's funny. I found some tapes from back in my past, and it's like how terrible I really was. I didn't even know, but I thought I was good. In my mind, I'm a legend, but I guess not. <laughs> and I remember a buddy of mine was the manager of the snowboard team at the, at the snowboard shop, and he said, hey, man, go down there. Tell him Jake sent you. And then tell them that you need to get on, you want to be a part of the team. So I went down to the snowboard shop, you know, and I'm there. And I'm like hanging out on the countertop. And I'm like, hey, guys, Jake sent me. And they're like, so? <laughs> well, Jake, Jake, Jake sent me to come talk to you about, like, being a part of the team. Okay, uh, the team's full right now. Sorry. Like, oh, okay, okay. You see, just because I dropped his name didn't mean anything. But then I went another day with him with me. I went with Jake, right? And Jake was like, hey, this guy's my friend. He's about as good as I am, and, and you need to get him on the team. And they're like, cool, man, absolutely. If Jake says you're legit, let's do it. Here's a snowboard. Here's some boots. Here's some pants. Here's a jacket. Here's a bunch of stickers. Put them all over everything and represent your team. You see, we like to go and we be like, Jesus sent me. And the world's like, so? Because we don't have him with. But when we take him with us, with his commission, with his presence, with his power. And we go, and we go with Jesus wherever he go. You see, the world, the principalities of darkness, the, the, the things that we wrestle against on a daily basis, the things that try to take us out emotionally and financially and, and, and are relationally, those type of things, they don't see us. They see Jesus who is with us because we go, we step out because Jesus said, all authority is given to me. And he says, there, therefore, because of what I just said, you go. You go and you create. You go and you baptize. You go and you teach them everything that I taught you. And you make more of you. You multiply. And you don't do it on your accord. You don't do it on your authority. You do it because I have the authority and I am with you wherever you will go. So the equation that we focus on. The equation like what you sow, you reap is exactly what we said in the title. The equation that we have to focus and balance on in our lives is come and go. Come to Jesus and go with Jesus. Come to Jesus and go with Jesus. Come to Jesus and go with Jesus. And I thought, you know what? I'm a visual guy. Let me give you a visual illustration. This little cup, there's some water in there. Let me finish that off. <laughs> Tap water, amazing, wow. This little cup is us. Right? We are empty on the inside where we're, we need something. So what does it do? The Bible says we got to come. So we focus on coming to Jesus. Jesus, I need you. 
I got a problem. All right, Jesus gave us some. Oh, I feel better about that, right? So we come to Jesus, and Jesus says, I want you to come to me with a pure heart. I want you to come with me with a noble heart. I want you to come with me. When you seek me with all of your heart, he says, you will find me. Pastor Luke, people tell me all the time, Pastor Luke, I, I, how, do I get to, how do I get more of God? It's so easy. I can't make you one. I can't convince you. I can't, I can't give you an exegesis on how to get more of God. Paul the Apostle says, the only thing I know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. All I can do is tell you about Jesus. you got to make the effort to go to Jesus. And so the Bible says, go. Jesus says, come to me. Okay, cool, I'm going to come. All right, I'm going to come. I'm going to come. I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to go to church on Wednesday. I'm going to go to church on Friday because Pastor Luke's preaching and shift, and that's going to be amazing. <laughs> and then and I'm going to go again, and I'm going to watch that thing on YouTube. And then there's that other pastor on TV that I really like. And you know what? I've never tried, but I'm going to watch the Daystar Network and then, and then TBN. I'm going to go, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to come. And then all of a sudden, we're full. And then what? You see, Jesus says, I did not call you to be a cistern. A cistern is where water flows in and has no exit. And when we focus on just one side of the equation, here we are, we come, and we do nothing with it. And so we're full, good. What does that serve? Uh, the, you're going to become the temperature of the room, lukewarm. Hmm. You, you, you're, you're going to get a little bit stagnant and a mosquito is going to come by and he's going to drop an egg in your stagnant water and, and then all of a sudden you're going to breed filth and, and nothing's going to happen because all you do is one side of the equation. So Jesus says, I don't want you just to come. He says, I want you to go. So what happens is we say, I'm going to go. And so we go. But then we don't pay attention to the other side of the equation. And we forget to come. And so we go, and 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 we pour ourselves out. And, and we, we give ourselves as a sacrifice to God. Like Paul the Apostle says to Timothy, says, I'm being continually poured out. And we go, and we go, but we, we forget to focus on the other side of the equation. And then what, what happens to us is that it, we're empty, and we burn out. And all of a sudden, there's nothing left to give. And we're frustrated and we're discouraged. And our faith is at the end of the road. Our family is not what we thought it would be. And Jesus said that you're going to do better things than I did. And I said, Jesus, I never saw that in my life. All I am is an empty vessel. Because the equation says come and go. So what do we do? We come to Jesus. And then we go. And then we come to Jesus and get filled. And then we go. And then we come, and then we go, and we come, and we go, and we come, and we go, and we come, and we go. And we're continually being emptied, but we're never dry. Because you focus on both sides. Jesus didn't come so that you could look like him. He came so that you could live like him. And see... Think about what this, what this means for the church. As Teresa last week was talking about the church, the body of Christ, not just the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, not just the 500, 600 people that are in here today as the church, the church globally, every person that professes Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. What, what, what ramifications would it be globally around the world if we would come to Jesus on a regular basis and we would go with Jesus on a regular basis and we would come to Jesus on a regular basis and then we would go with Jesus on a regular basis and then we would come to Jesus and then we would go and then we would come and then we would go and every time one side of the scale feels tipped we do the other and we keep going and we're going and we're going and all of a sudden the scale starts to look like this and now all of a sudden we live a balanced life you know what you can take the equation of come and go and you can take talk it like James did faith and works believe in God do something about it come to God get full of God Go out there with God and do something about it. Faith and works. Faith and works. And what would the church, think about it, think about it for a moment. What would the church globally around the world accomplish in the glory and in the name of Jesus if we would just get the simple equation right? To come to Jesus with all that we need and to go with Jesus for all the world needs. Man, I wish I said it. I wish it was my statement. And I almost kind of debated today whether or not I should just make it my statement. But Jabin Chavez, I got to give him credit. Jabin Chavez said on Friday, and, and this is the only time, next time I'm going to say I said it. But <laughs> God's not asking you to change the world. That's his job. But God is asking you to bring change to your world. 
Go with Jesus. You see, you alone may not change the world. But when you're full of Jesus and you go, like Paul tells Timothy, I'm going to be poured out. You go and you pour it out. And then Jesus says, well, you got some room in there? Let me, get, let me get you some more of that. And you go and you go again. And now all of a sudden the world that you live in, the change that you so desire in your life, that you desire in your finances, that you desire in your family, that you desire in your children, that you desire in your emotions, it begins to happen. It begins to change. Why? Because you are coming to God with all of your heart. And God says, man, there is something about them that I am going to just like lay them down with the Holy Spirit on the inside of them. And people are going to start looking at you saying, man, what's new about you? And it's like, it's not my diet. It's my Jesus. And because I got so much Jesus in me, I'm going to take that and I'm going to go and I'm going to share it. Pastor Luke, what does that mean? I, I don't know what to do. What does that mean to go? How about praying for your neighbor? How about when somebody says they got a problem, say right now, boom, let's pray right now, right here, and believe for a miracle. You see, Peter and Paul, they didn't walk down the, 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 the gate called Beautiful and see the people. They didn't say, well, you know what? I'm going to pray for you later on tonight. They said, listen, I got, I'll give you what I have right now. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the lame man who all of his life had been lame in that very instant rose up with the power of God. Why? Because they were full and because they went with Jesus. You know, Jesus died somewhere between 26 and 30 AD, right in that area. 300 years later, 300 years later, one of the most significant events within Western modern history happened, and that's called the, the Edict of Milan, where the Emperor Constantine of the greatest empire the world has ever seen in modern empires. One of the greatest world forces, the greatest impact, the greatest influence on the world, the Emperor of, Const Emperor of Rome, Constantine, signed the Edict of Milan, which officially designated Christianity no longer as a persecuted belief system, but rather as the official backing state religion of the greatest empire on the earth. Think about that for a moment. Here's a group of people that heard a man. Here's a group of, that, group of people that saw a man. And without ever lifting a sword, without ever causing a fight, without ever doing anything but what Jesus Christ said, to love and to live, they overthrew the greatest power on earth in the course of 300 years and changed the entire history of the earth with love. Because they came to Jesus and then they went with Jesus. The equation, church, for you and I is to come to God. Don't feel like you can't go to him. Don't feel like you can't go to him. He says, come to me. You've got problems, and I know you've got problems. You've got problems you don't know about that I know about. Come to me. And then he says, I'm going to fill you. And when I fill you, go with me, and I'll empty you so that I can fill you again with something new. And I will take you and empty you again, and I will fill you, and I will empty you, and I will fill you. And in the meantime, everything that you are pouring out is going right into somebody else's glass. Because that is the equation God has for us. Come and go. Faith and works. Believe and do. Get and give. You can start right now. You can start shining a light to your family. You can start shining a light to your workplaces. You can start by giving into the kingdom of God. You can start by supporting. You can start. You don't have to go to Africa to go. You can start where you're at right now. But Jesus says, go with me. He'll take you places. And I love what he says at the end of that great commission. He says this in verse number uh, 20. Teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's no reason to be afraid because you've got Jesus. When you go with Jesus, he's with you the whole time. He's there in spirit and in truth. He's there with you today. And church, we've got to come and we've got to go. Come and go. As you walk out of this place, come to Jesus and go with Jesus. Simple equation. Live out a life of balance. And I'll tell you what, God will reveal things in your life you've never seen before. Did you guys get something out of the Word of God today? Amen. Amen. I'm going to drink my water. Oh, this is super good. You're like, Pastor Luke, I want some of that. You got extra right there? Can I have some? Because it's hot. I love you, Paul. Hey, listen, before we leave tonight, I want to take a quick moment. I'll ask you, just give me a moment more of your time. I won't take much more of your time, I promise. Give me a moment more of your time and let me talk to you. You see, I want to talk to you about the condition of your eternal life. I want to talk to you about your presence and your place with God.
right now because you say, you know what, man, I'm here. I, I've been coming, but I don't feel like there's anything changing in my life. And you know what? I, I would hate for you to leave this place with the basis of presumption in your life, thinking that everything's good between you and God because you sat in a church service or because you had a title on your name or because your parents told you or something uh, when you were a kid, a Christian or a Methodist or a Lutheran or a Seventh-day Adventist or whatever it might be. I would hate for you to leave under presumption which masquerades itself as faith but ends in death because you think everything's with you, right with, between you and God. So let me ask you a question. The Bible tells us that a man needs to examine himself from time to time. So why don't you look in your heart? Why don't you look in your life and answer this question? Nobody would know the answer between you and, but you and God. If you were to leave tonight and you were to die from heat stroke, <laughs> would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Well, you know, Pastor, like, I, I don't know. You know I, I don't know about heaven or hell. I don't know if it exists or not. I, I couldn't tell you. Listen, just because you don't know whether it exists or not, just because you don't know if it's real or not, just because you've never experienced it in your life before doesn't mean it's not real. Why? Because there's a lot of things that we see. There's a lot of things in our world that we know exist without us ever seeing them, without us ever experiencing, without without us ever feeling them. Think about it like this. There's radio waves going right now from me to the antenna in the sound booth and then back to the speakers in the system right now. You don't see them. You don't feel them. You don't experience them, but you know they're real because you hear the sound of my voice. You see, heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. Real enough for God to talk about it. Real enough for Jesus Christ to teach us about it. Real enough for the Bible to be preserved over thousands of years and then confirmed thousands of years later to be accurate and true so that you and I would take it serious. So I want to encourage you. What does that say? You see, how you come to your answer, how you stand, or how you arrive at your conclusion of that answer has a lot to say about your position and your place with God. Well, you know what? I I just, I'm not not sure. You know, I think that if if I was to die, I'd go to heaven. I, I hope so. I want to. Did you know that nowhere in God's word does it say that you can think? Nowhere in God's word does it say that you can hope? Nowhere in God's word does it say that you can have enough desire to make it so that you get into heaven? That he'll look at you and say, man, you, you, you wanted it enough like the little train. I think I can. I think I can. Nowhere in God's word does it say that. Nowhere in God's word does it say that you can assume, well, you know what? I, my parents told me when I was growing up, but we were Christians, and I always just thought that that meant that, that that's what it meant, that I was going to go to heaven. I'm not a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, so I always thought that that just meant by default or classification that I'm going to go to heaven. You see, nowhere in the Bible does it say that God's looking for a default classification system. God's not looking for your allegiance to one or the other. God says this, this, you can't get out of you can't get to heaven. You can't be right with God based on assumption or based on hopes, based on dreams, based on religious affiliation because you went to church, because you, you call yourself a Christian, because you've got a cross around your neck or a, a tattoo somewhere on your body. You can't get to heaven because you've given yourself a label or a title on a U.S. census. You won't find that in the Bible. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I mean, I, I, I carried the pastor's Bible. I've volunteered in the youth ministry. I've been to crusades before. I've helped the churches. Doesn't that, doesn't that mean something? Listen, does it, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're active, involved in church, you've got a membership card to your church? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend on a regular basis that you're going to get into heaven, that you're doing everything right, that you're in the right position with God? And you can't find that. Because there's something more than just works. It's the balance, faith and works. And so you want to try to focus all of your life on works, on the outward. God says, I'm not just looking on the outward. As a matter of fact, we think on the outward. Well, if I'm a good person, good people go to heaven. I'm a spiritual person, spiritually aware that there's a God or a deity out there that's greater than I. And I I couldn't even suppose to know. Listen, God's not looking for that. God says, listen, your good deeds according to my righteousness. And his word, he says this, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I on our own could ever, ever, nothing that we could do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into the kingdom of God and to be right with God on our own. Why? Because God's not just looking for one side of the scale works. And he's not looking for one side of the scale belief because belief without action is nothing. The Bible says faith without works is dead. You can believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior all you want, but without acting upon it with your life, it's dead. Those are the words of God. Jesus says it like this. Listen, you can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way or author's way. Jesus says it like this. The only way you can get there is God's way. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, he says, goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it any other way but God's way. Jesus says it like this. He says in John, the third chapter, he's speaking to a religious man named Nicodemus. And Jesus says, John, uh, says Nicodemus, in order to see the kingdom of God, In order to be a part of it, in order to open your eyes, in order to live, he says, you must be born again. Oh, you're talking about that weirdo, crazy, out of control stuff that they do on the movies. And Pastor Luke, I'm just not real into that. Listen, I don't care what society or culture is made born again out to be. But from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in God's mind, in God's heart, it's always meant the same thing. Here it is. Jesus even says it like this. Some translations say must be born from above. 
spiritual regeneration, why God wants to take the old you and he wants to create something new on the inside of you and that only happens with the spirit of God on the inside by surrendering your heart, by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Jesus says it like this in the book of Revelation. He says, listen, I'm going to come back. I'd rather find that you're hot or I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, because if I find that you're lukewarm, I will vomit you. It's a shocking statement. I will vomit you from my mouth. And in that very same statement, he says, listen, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And whoever opens the door, he says, I will come in and I will dine with him and they will dine with me and we will be together. You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. So often we say, well, if God wants me, he'll take me. If God wants me, he'll elect me. God elected you on the cross of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And today, the opportunity, the invitation is at your door. The door of your spirit, the door of your heart right now, the spirit of God is knocking saying, will you open the door to me today? Will you accept and will you choose life in Jesus Christ, leaving yourself behind and going forward with the life that Jesus has for you? Will you come to Jesus, he says, and will you go with him through the course of your life? The decision is yours and yours alone. Jesus says it like this. He says that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his father. He says that if you deny him, he will deny you. Today I want to give you the opportunity to receive the invitation. In just a moment, we're going to pray together. And, and if you want to be included in this prayer, if you want to be a part of this, if you want to come into and be a part of Jesus Christ and surrender and give your life to Jesus Christ, headed for heaven, leaving hell behind today, in just a moment we're going to do so. But before we do, Jesus says, confess me before men and I'll confess you before my father. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. On the count of three, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. And I'll smack my hands together real loud, just like that. If that's you in this moment, in this place, when I do that, on the count of three, I'm asking you to do something real bold. I'm asking you to pop your hand up. You see, what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what, today I want to make the decision to follow Jesus with all of my heart, with all of my, heart, with all of my life. You're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to be included in that prayer. I want, to, I want to surrender my life. I want to go forward with God. I want to ensure my place with God in heaven today. You see, I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge you. You can put it right back down. And we'll go forward together from there. But it starts with you, well, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. The people I came with are going to know and they're going to see me. Listen, I'm not here to embarrass you. They're not here to embarrass you. We're here to build you up and to support you and to see you go in all that God has for you. But it starts by making the decision today. And that's what you're doing is you're making a decision. So who should raise your hands? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus, if that's you in just a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. Who should make a decision or who should give their heart and life to Jesus Christ? If you're not sure, listen, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you is God's seal of approval on you. You don't have to walk out of this place wondering, am I right with God? God wants you to know today you are by giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and the confirmation of his love on the inside of your heart. If you've been living lukewarm, what does that mean, lukewarm? A little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down, occasional church attendance, doing some of your own things instead of God's saying, listen, if you've been running from God instead of to God, if that's you in this place, in just a moment, you get ready, you pop your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, you put it right back down, and we'll go forward together from there. So simple, so easy. Starts today by making that decision. You've had doctors and dentist appointments, now it's a divine appointment between you and God. So I'm going to count to three wherever I'm at, you guys. If, it's, if you're in the back in the family rooms, I can see you through the windows and all across this auditorium from the front row to the back row, side to side, wherever you're at. This is your moment. This is your time. Today is a day of your salvation. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Jesus is knocking on your heart saying, will you open the door to me today? Open that door and watch your entire life change with the power of God in one moment. It starts by accepting Jesus. You ready? I'm going to count to three. If that's you in this place, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down, and we'll go forward together from there. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three, four. I see that. Four wise people. Anybody else? I see you guys right over there. Four wise people. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I see the hand over there. Five, six. I got you guys. Did you already have your hands up, you two, or no? Are you... Did you have yours and put it down? I couldn't tell. Well, I don't want to count you twice. That's why I'm asking. So five, because, you know, sometimes they say preachers lie. We don't. Four or five wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Anybody else in this place today? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, this is your moment. This is your time. Anybody else today? I see everybody's pointing in that direction. Where? Family room. Give me a wave in the family room. I can't see your hand if that's you. Somebody in the family room. The ushers are pointing in the family room. There's no ushers over there by the family room. Okay, there's somebody maybe in the family room. How about this? Why don't we do this? Let's all stand together. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, you're serious about this today. You say, I want to do this. I want to be included in that prayer. Come on. Why don't you get out of your seat, get out of your chair, come meet me right here. Let's change destinies together right here, right now. If you, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on. Wherever you're at, come meet me at this place right now. Let's change destinies together. Come on. You come. Come on. 
Is that you in the family room? If that was you, come on. Come on. Right here, buddy. Hey, give me five, dude. Whoa. Girl, can I get a high five? You are awesome. No, that's like, that, you gotta give me a good one. All right, all right. Hey, listen, guys. Whole new life is ahead of you. I gotta tell you something, okay? You're not, not going to a funeral, you're not going to the morgue, you're going to a birthday celebration. Whose birthday is it? It's your birthday. You're gonna get born again today. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. You're gonna, Walk away from everything that you had or everything that, that you thought was bad about you. And God's going to give you a complete new name. And it's called redeemed. It's called saved. It's called headed for heaven. It's called Christian. It's called son and daughter. It's called king. It's called royalty. God's got a new destiny for you today. A whole new life. So here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name's Pastor Joel. So we're going to pray a prayer. He's going to lead you in a prayer right now. And that's going to take you guys right over there. Nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets. Okay, you made it through me sweating and, 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 and hooting and hollering. You made it, okay? He's going to take you guys right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information. We even got like little comic books for the kids so that you can read and look at the pictures. It's super cool. To help point you in the right direction. You say, what do I do now? We're going to help set you off in the right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back and hang out with us. We want you to come back. Well, we have friends. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you here at church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, a soda, sit down with you in our cafe, get you some french fries or sandwich or something like that, and, and teach you some things about the Word of God for just a couple of weeks to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to your life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything Jesus has and you grow strong in the ways of God and you walk with Jesus all the days of your life. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with my buddy, Pastor Joel. Awesome.